Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, we started Thrive Bioscience about six years ago in Boston because we found an incredibly important area of life sciences that was almost completely ignored, which is cell culture. So next slide, please. So Thrive makes instruments and software for researchers to basically be able to study cells better. Um, my own background, by the way, I've uh, started 11 companies. I have four uh, multi-billion dollar exits. Uh, my first three companies were in software um, and the rest were in life sciences. Um, a comparable company is Cytic, where we automated cytology labs instead of cell culture labs. And we sold that company for $6 billion. 90% um, of all pap smears are now read with those instruments. Um, so we have a team of very experienced people. My co-founder is uh, really quite incredible. Um, he invented uh, the sequencers that Illumina uses, which are the most widely used in genomics. And our chairman was president of Thermo Fisher, the largest company in this area. Uh, we have significant collaborations with a big pharmaceutical company, Otsuka in Japan, and with 11 research institutions, the Broad Institute, Harvard Stem Cell Institute, University of Texas Medical Branch, um, Stanford Stem Cell Corps, and, and others. There's very limited competition in this area. And as a result, we've been able to put together a really comprehensive IP portfolio. We have 74 patent applications of which slides is 24. I just heard we have 25 issued. So we expect sales of about 5 million this coming year. Um, the year after 19 million and in 2026 over 150 million. That's without an acquisition, which um, uh, we're hoping uh, to close shortly. So we're raising $8 million under a convertible note that converts into the Series B at a 20% discount. We've raised 4 million of that. Um, this, it's a, a we're over, so th this is a convertible into the Series B. And what's, a, the, what's the uh, interest rate? At a 20% discount and a 5% interest rate, which accrues. You're not in it for the coupon. Um, no. We started uh, with 1.5 million, um, so we're quite oversubscribed. Um, the so reason that we're raising, raising eight and what's left? I'm raising eight and we have four left because we just found out um, a company that we know very well, which is a supplier, is for sale. And um, so you've got four left. Right. So <coughs> we hope to acquire that company. It uh, will do about $7 million next year and is profitable. Next slide, please. So we have this saying, and, and the saying um, is good science needs good cells. And that's the uh, title of, of this talk. Um, so I want to tell you about cell culture. Cell culture is an enormous market, over $18 billion per year. And it's basically key to the biomedical research. Almost all research is done in cells. And it's conducted manually, just like it was 65 years ago. Hours are spent looking <coughs> at a microscope at cells, and then the cells are put back in the incubator. And guess what? All the data is lost. And because of the fact that it's manual, these cells vary by experiment, by lab, over time. And so we have data that's highly variable and non-comparable. And then we take these cells we know very little about. In fact, I would say Uber knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And we put them into incredibly expensive instruments that we spend billions of dollars a year on. But the variability of the cells swamps the outcome. And so this is part of what's known as the reproducibility crisis. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I just want to give a little review for what, of what cell culture is. And basically, we're recreating in a laboratory. What's under that mask on the title? Um, so artificially recreating cells environments to grow cells in the lab. In the lab. And we do a terrible job at it. Uh, mislabeling rates are 11% to 34%. This is extraordinary, but it's common in an unautomated um, process. That's bigger than human error, like the average human error. Because it's, it's accumulated over 65 years. And so um, there's a 34% chance that 
a researcher doing drug discovery, which is our largest market, is studying what he thinks are liver cells, but they're actually pancreatic cells. Um, those statistics come from uh, National Institutes of Health. Next slide, please. So we really <coughs> fail at doing cell culture, even though it is the basis for much of, of, of research. And in fact, Nature Magazine talked about it as a crisis rocking research. And the first real bombshell came when Amgen did a study with um, 100 scientists over 10 years to try to replicate 53 landmark studies in oncology, and they could not replicate 90%. And 50% approximately of the cause of not being able to reproduce was traced to cell culture. So cell culture basically is slowing cures and placing patients at risk because non-reproducible research, it gets cited on average, non-reproducible research is cited within two years, an average of 2000 times. So we're accumulating um, this, this knowledge, which is really not, um, not knowledge. And we're also putting patients at risk in a seven year period, over 125,000 patients were in clinical trials where the research was later found to be not reproduced. So now are you talking next slide. about please. cell culture in terms of a production? More method, next slide. A production methodology for proteins and peptides and what have you, or are you looking at cell therapy, uh, cell, mm -hmm. cell stores as well? Uh, next slide, Marty. So very good question. So cell culture does all those things. And um, we're starting with the research market because um, okay. it's um, oh, it's not refreshing the screen. There, there we go. go. It's taking a while. Sorry about that. Sure, no problem. So uh, we're starting in the research market um, where those things are done in a small scale. Right. But an even bigger opportunity for us in three or four years is manufacturing or bioprocessing. Um, and we're getting pulled there more quickly than than we thought. It's a different market. It's it's a fabulous market. High margins, long sales cycle though. But once you're in um, you're written into an FDA good manufacturing process, you're there for 10 years. Uh, but they always want validated instruments. So it's not a great place to start. Research is a great place to start. People are open to new, new products. But are your are equipments there for sort of analytical purposes or for, um, uh, or for part of the manufacturing uh, uh, you know, so line? So it's being used for really breakthrough insights and documentation. Okay. So we are creating these enormous databases of cells for the first time in, in live cell biology. There are, um, uh, we have of our 12 customers, several that are producing, um, but at a small scale. But nevertheless, they are trying to control their processes, which are almost impossible currently because you don't have consistent information. So in other words, you would be selling to somebody like ATCC. Yes. So ATCC would be in the middle between research and production. Right. Um, but they actually um, have compared our instrument to other instruments and said that our analytics was the best that they could find. So we expect to have a, a you know, good number of sales there, dozens and dozens. But they are, they are really a bioprocessing manufacturing but they do some R&D to optimize That's the processes and, and we play there. Um, so what's really uh, unusual about our instrument compared to any other instrument is we're the only instrument that can actually find and track a single cell or a colony over time. This has been the, the holy grail that's been unachieved. So that means you can actually study what goes on in that cell and get back to that cell over weeks, over months, because our customers, take data every three hours, every four hours, they'll image our, our plates as part of creating their database. And we capture up to 60 focal planes. We can actually go higher, but we had to pick up a, a number, two and a half microns to 50 microns apart. So that we're actually creating 3D type images because biology is, is not flat. Um, and one of the fastest growing areas in cell culture is actually tissue culture because it's a model between cells on the bottom of a plate in animals. It's a big gulf in between there. And, and, so, and, what, and what, so there's a lot of your, research in tissues. What is your, do you use EM for your imaging? Uh, so we, we use very um, basic microscopy. So we, just photo, op, photo microscopy. Yeah, um, bright field and phase contrast. Um, uh, and um, 
So, Tom, you have about 10 minutes left. So, okay. we either want to table the questions and get to the end. Sure. Or sorry, I need sorry, just sorry. to figure out which, which way you're doing it. We get the slides back up, though. It would be great. All set. Okay. So, while, um, so while we're getting the slides, we have a family of products. Um, we have two on the market. One is a benchtop imager. Uh, takes a single plate of cells at a time. And what we call the cell assist 50, which automatically uh, images cells, um, 50 plates, and it can do it every two, three or four hours. So um, the, the applications um, are some of the most important applications. Next, next slide, I think, Brian. And I, I did the next one after that. Excellent. Yeah. I'm on slide. And I did the one after that too. I think I went through them. Uh, collaborative cell assist, I'm on. Could I'm you go sorry. to the next? So I want to show some Im images here. Um, the regular cells. If you can go back, um, maybe one more, go back. Okay. Okay. You go back. Sorry, I think you went forward. And just one more back. I'm not just so I know what's there. <clears throat> so this is an example of what data can do. Remember I told you that there's actually 11% to 34% mislabeling. And here's an example from the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT where for the first time they're able to catch the fact that they were mislabeling cells. Of course, everybody thinks they, they don't do it, but the power of data can really increase the, the quality. Next slide, please. So I wanted to show you some images um, of what people are using our plate for. This is incredible. Um, so the person, I think we missed the slide, um, but, um, a chairman of the biochemistry department at University of Texas Medical Branch said that Thrive will change the world. And it was because of these images. So they're the leading center for infectious disease research in, in the United States. Galveston National Laboratory is where Andromeda bugs go. This lab was credited by Pfizer for being uh, one of the principal reasons that they got their vaccine to market first. And they're using our instrument um, for the first time, they're able to characterize what a virus does to cells. The current standard is that you put an overlay of the virus on cells, you wait seven days, you fix it, stain it, and take a look at it. So you have data at one point in time, and you have to touch the cells again in order to stain them. And so the challenge that they um, used our instrument for was to not have to stain it so that they didn't have to handle um, coronavirus again, and so they could continue to follow the cells. They, we achieved that easily. They then said, we would like to understand how the virus forms because currently no instrument can do what you see there, which is watch this, a plaque forming over seven days. And actually as a result of these images, they discovered that they had a variant in, in their cell culture plate, which was confounding their data. They were screening for, for drugs. So this is something that has never been able to be done before. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is an example of tracking a single cell over time. A little bit hard to see from, um, unless you're close up, but there's a single cell all the way on the left. It doubles and continues, and it actually turns into two stem cell colonies. And the gold standard actually in growing stem cells for regenerative medicine and research is that you have a colony that's homogeneous uh, genomically, but nobody can tell that until the cell assist. Next slide. So I mentioned tissues um, and organoids. This is um, an example of actually a um, stem cell derived organoid that the Broad Institute was imaging. And they said that we are the best instrument for imaging tissues. Next slide. About five minutes. 
So um, I gave you my background a little bit about Alan, who um, after 25 years in genomics, producing huge amounts of data, uh, Lumina 90% market share, and he built those uh, sequencers. Um, he and I want to do that for cell biology. Um, we have 17 people at the company. Our chairman was president of Thermo Fisher and um, another one of our outside board members, Brock Reeve, head of the Harvard uh, Stem Cell Institute. Morning. So um, on the financing side, we've raised $29 million to date. You can see um, valuations have um, risen nicely from post money of 10 million to 23 million to 40 million to 65 million. Um, we are going to target um, completing our series B for $10 million um, mid next year. Um, and the note that converts into that for 8 million, um, we hope to complete uh, uh, this month so we can acquire that uh, nice little profitable company that's one of our suppliers and is focused on um, environmental controls in cell culture. So it's really a great fit. Our largest uh, shareholders, the Estee Lauder family, they have invested in two of my previous companies, um, HNC Software and, uh, and Cytic. We also have the Milstein family, um, New York Real Estate, the Parker Brothers family, um, Monopoly game. I actually am spending Monopoly money, I guess, and I always wanted to do that as a, as a kid. Make it. Um, and we have seven angel groups, in, including Life Science Angels, Sidecar Angels, uh, New York Angels, um, a lot of industry veterans, former CEOs of Novartis, Cytic, uh, Patheon, Johns Manville, and uh, actually our IP attorneys think so highly of our, it's not because we couldn't pay our bell, bills, they voluntarily. Is that Life Science Angels on New Jersey? Sorry? Is that Life Science Angels out of New Jersey? No, uh, California. Okay. Next slide. And Louder, is that the Louder Group in California or in New York? So um, both have invested, both uh, Louder Gary. Partners, um, Gary Louder okay. at, 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 um, in um, Palo Alto area. And um, the New York uh, family office from several funds has also invested. Interesting. OK, so great. How much has the founders contributed? Um, I've put in $2 million of the 29.4, and Alan's put in my co-founder half a million. Next slide, please. So in terms of returns, um, I, um, obviously these are hard to predict, but I expect this to be my largest exit um, because it's um, larger than the cytology market. It's not FDA regulated, um, and it has many segments. It's applicable to almost all of life sciences. So we expect a 20x return based on our projections and comparables. Uh, multiples for um, publicly traded companies and M&A for our type of, of company with under 300 million in revenue is 10 times to 35 times trailing revenue. But we're most likely to be acquired. We fit well within 15 to 20 companies such as uh, Nikon, Fujifilm, uh, Thermo Fisher, Lanza, um, Perkin Elmer, and we've been contacted by all of those, actually. Um, and the, the public company comps are really excellent as well, about 35. Um, they're trading at about 35 times trailing. To what revenues. extent is all of this IP? Uh, enormous, everything. You have to buy our instruments or buy us. We have um, uh, 74 patent applications in all areas of software, machine learning, um, use of blockchain, um, uh, some new types of um, microscopy. We actually modify, even though we use phase contrast and bright field, we do it in a different way and have very advanced algorithms for focusing and things like that. So I'd, I'd say um, I'd, of the 11 companies I started, I learned the importance of IP when you're at the stage of selling. Um, and actually um, current companies on that list are violating our IP, but um, we're not about to get into fights about that until we've filed a lot more. And that may be the, the last slide at 19 minutes and 30 seconds. Great, why don't, why don't you, um, uh, any more questions or questions from the audience? Let me just take this down. A question. Sure. Um, largely, uh, your investor base seems to have been um, angels, high net worth, family offices. Uh, at what point do you think you'd be ready for an institution or an institutional or institution like venture fund 
who's, right. who's involved in your space? Really excellent question. So the venture funds typically do not invest in our segment life science tools until they're revenue generating. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that instruments and biology have created a lot of problems for a lot of companies. So in fact, this coming round, um, we expect to be um, entirely a venture, a venture round. You think you're ready for it now with the acquisition you're making? Um, um, I think we're ready without the acquisition. Um, it'll be right. VC backed, but um, having that acquisition uh, moves us faster to an exit, either a public offering or to be acquired. We see that company's products in every single lab that we visit. Um, you have big, you have big dreams, and I think you're going to reach them. Well, thank you very much. I, um, it's that vision that keeps you going when when uh, the going gets tough. <laughs>